Guys, welcome to another episode of the Burn Factory Podcast. Let's say what's up to the man, the myth, Royce Clayton. What's up, Royce? What's going on, guys? How what's you doing? Well, I could draw a little bit, and I chose the tag name Oz. <laughs> <laughs> Coaching is awesome. I was like, man, I don't want to go there and see. Uh, I said, well, let's go take the trip. Yeah. So I made him do it like my dad. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Burn Factory Podcast. I'm your host, Parise, joined by my co-host, my brother, the one and only Phoenix. Say what's up to the camera. What's up, y'all? This is called Burn Factory for a reason. I was literally caught on fire. 50% chance of surviving, and through that, I started this podcast because I believe every single person out there on this planet has a burn moment somewhere in their life. Yes, and to clarify what a burn moment is, it is actually a really tough time in your life that you had to overcome to ultimately get you where you are today. But another thing that we'll do on this podcast is our guest is going to get a chance at beating one of us in a golf competition. And if they do that, then they will win the Burn Factory podcast belt. All right, Priest, I just got to say, there's something about play, playoff baseball that just... It's so different from any other sport. You can go see a baseball game in September compared to an October game. It is just totally different. Everyone's just on their feet for every single pitch, mm -hmm. which I love. Yeah, even a routine pop-out, like, people go crazy for, which is crazy. Mm, but Because they think it's a home run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was actually on TikTok yesterday, and I saw Bryce Harper. When he was playing Little League, he was 6'1". Phoenix, you were 6'1 at 11 years old. I know, I know. I was, I was kind of a big kid. If you pop that up there, look at that. Look at me. <laughs> Phoenix looked like the coach's son. <laughs> exactly. Was that, is that a Dodgers hoodie? Oh, man. I'm not even a Dodgers fan. That's kind of crazy. Just look how much taller you are than everyone. Jeez, everyone's like five foot three and you're six foot. <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah, I was one and done in baseball. I did one year and that was about it. But speaking of baseball, Priest, we have an amazing guest today. He's a World Series champion. He's an all-star, and he played 17 years in the MLB. That's, that's your whole life. life. That's, that's practically more than Imagine that. But let's say what's up to the man, the myth, Royce Clayton. What's up, Royce? What's going on, guys? How what's you doing? On? Where's the backflip? I was I waiting know. for it. I know. I had to cancel that after a while. Cancel. I might break my back trying to do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you got to teach me how to backflip. How do you, how do you even backflip? I don't know. I just something I used to do as a kid. We used to get mattresses, so we didn't have like the full on gymnasiums, but we had like little mattresses, and we'd lay them on the ground and just practice until we figured it out. But you know, a couple of little, you know, little catastrophes along the way, but Ooh. you figure it out through trial and error. Yeah, I definitely need someone to like kind of like guide me and like flip me to do that. But yeah, you're too it's just big. A you might have to use <laughs> I know. I'm gonna need, <laughs> when you're little, I just, my 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 boys they could backflip. My daughters backflip. But it was easy to teach them because, like you said, that when they're little, they have no fear. So mm -hmm. they just jump off anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, being older, I mean, now I got so much fear. I'm right. landing on my neck. I mean, it's kind of scary. But that's that's one thing I want to do before I die is learn how to backflip for sure. Well, that's a goal. You got to get at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Every time I do one, I just quit midair. I'm just like, I can't do this. I'm you don't want to do that. Injured. You got to keep going. Keep <sighs> rotating. Yeah, land <laughs> right tough. on your neck. That's tough. <laughs> That stuff. Then I won't be able to golf anymore. Right. <laughs> but, so. All right, Royce. So on this podcast, we do use the acronym BURN. So each letter does mean a different like time in your life. So are you ready to spell BURN in your life? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. B stands for beginning. So take me back to your childhood, your high school days. Was there a BURN moment or were there significant, like many BURN moments that happened to you that ultimately got you to where you are today? Yeah, I think the first BURN moment for choosing baseball as a whole and, and, and having a passion was uh, my dad would take me to Dodger games when I was little. We knew somebody that, you know, had to hook up for the tickets. So I uh, was able to go to a bunch of games and had a passion for baseball. And uh, this one game, he took me to go see the St. Louis Cardinals play and saw Ozzie Smith out there. And I was just fixated on watching him. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't take my eyes off him. It seemed like he was having more fun than everybody else. And when I got home, I told my dad, I said, Dad, that's what I want to do. I said, I want to play a shortstop like Ozzie Smith. And, you know, he was, he was supportive. said, hey, man, just, if that's what you want to do, set your mind to it. And uh, I was obsessed with collecting everything I could about Ozzie Smith. Uh, my mom worked for uh, TWA. Uh, it was Transworld Airlines. It was airlines that existed before you guys were born. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, she worked for TWA. 
and uh, their main headquarters was in St. Louis, ironically. So she would bring me back every time she went to St. Louis, she'd bring me back little things like a poster of Ozzy, little, uh, you know, figurines or whatever. And I just started collecting everything. I have videotapes. So I really became a student of him emulating myself into everything that he did. And uh, that just kind of spurred on one thing after another, uh, obviously in a very positive way. Uh, kids in the neighborhood kind of ridiculed me or whatever because, you know, a lot of people was up to different things, but uh, they knew this is what I had a passion for. And I caught some heat for it, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. It's like, ain't nobody coming out the hood playing baseball. Forget about it, you know? Yeah. And uh, baseball wasn't a big sport. It was football, basketball. And, and um, yeah, I just kept on my passion. As a matter of fact, a good story is, that, like, back in the days, they used to have, like, um, little uh, graffiti artists or whatever. And I could draw a little bit, and I chose a tag named Oz. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. I would hit up everything Oz. Yeah. But, and it just, everything just took on a persona of positivity through that, though. You know, no matter what, it kept me focused, kept me on the grind, uh, going out to work out, become better, doing what I could to improve my game. So that's how it started. Yeah. Uh, do you think there's any, like, challenges just staying focused with baseball while all of your other friends are playing baseball? Or, uh, sorry, baseball and all of your friends are playing football, basketball. Was it just kind of hard to stay focused? Yeah, I played other sports. You know, I, I dabbled in, fo in football a little bit. I just wasn't that big. And, and then in basketball, I was good because I played varsity as, a, uh, a, I think, my sophomore year. And I went to a high school that was a big basketball school, St. Bernard's. A shout-out to St. Bernard's. <laughs> but uh, it was a, known as a basketball school, so I was quick, athletic, so I was able to make the varsity as a, as a sophomore. Mm. Um, so to answer your question... I still had that focus of baseball. I was just using basketball because it was okay. I didn't like practicing it. So that was when I knew. Because baseball, I didn't mind practicing. Like, I would always be up by myself. I'd go after practice and go up to this little school called Lock to Hair and hit by myself. So I just I just enjoyed doing it. So um kind of correlates to where I had the same type of passion for golf. I just like going out and hitting balls. Yeah. So you guys know how yeah, it yeah. is, right? Mm -hmm. So, but basketball, man, it's just too much. It's just coaches yelling at you all the time, running up and down the court, and I thought it was stupid. <laughs> so I was like, nah, I'm cool. And I just kind of, um, you know, stay focused on baseball. Yeah. I mean, so your senior year, you're obviously doing really well. I mean, you were down there batting like 500. Yeah. Uh, so was there a burn moment in just like staying focused? I know you're probably getting college offers, coaches talking to you. I know, like, nowadays, like, with social media, everyone's comparing themselves. Oh, this kid has this offer, but I'm better than him. Like, how did you stay focused and just, like, let the chips fall where they fall? Man, it was crazy because, like, one of my guys that we grew up together, he was a year ahead of me. And, you know, he's like, well, he, he had signed to L LMU, which at the time was big because we didn't have baseball scholarships. A lot of kids get baseball scholarships out of – St. Burns High School is mostly basketball, like I said. So he was just like, hey, I got, I'm going to take this LMU offer because, you know, our school's too small. You ain't going to get an offer like that, blah, blah, blah. And so my senior year, I had offers everywhere. So I was just like, oh, that was your deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? That you was yours. So I committed to USC. Uh -huh. And, you know, I was like a childhood dream of, of mine because my dad was a big USC fan. And... um I went to USC sports camps because it was free. My, my, my cousin, my, my dad would drop us off in front of campus. We'd get free lunch, uh, go out and play basketball, football, baseball, everything. So that was <clears throat> my indoctrination to SC, and I fell in love with the school. So I told my dad I didn't want you having to pay for my school or trying to you know, hustle with my mom and dad to hustle and try to do that. So I said, I'm just going to work on getting a scholarship and – had a five-year scholarship to USC. So, wow. yeah, that was the first goal I wanted to accomplish. And um, after that, I just knew that that was, you know, anything else would be icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, obviously, you you knew from the start that you wanted to go to USC, but didn't you op you opted out of going to USC, right? And you went right to the minors. So, what kind of went into that decision? Man, like I said, my dad was like, 
adamant about me going to school because, you know, education is big, you know, and especially having an opportunity to get a free education from USC. He was like, you know, um, that's where you're going. So I was trying to negotiate and talk to my brother and my mom. And uh, I said, uh, do you think my dad, do you think dad would let me go if I went in the first round? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know how your dad is. Yeah, so, yeah, education. So then I got, I got drafted. Sure enough, I got drafted in the first round by the Giants. Mm-hmm. So I told my brother, I said, man, go tell dad I want to sign. Yeah. And um, he, was, he was hesitant. He was like, man, if this is a decision you want to make, but you're going to be without an education. Mm-hmm. I said, I just feel it in my body. This is right. You know, I want to take care of you, do what I can for you guys too, you know. And uh, he allowed me to sign. But funny story, I went for my senior trip, and the Giants came out, like the GM, the head scout came to my house. I wasn't mm-hmm. there. Yeah. So <laughs> I called my mom, and I said, Mom, how'd the meeting go? You know, everything went cool. She's like, son, your dad kicked him out the house. <laughs> oh, oh, no I was way. Like, man, I'm never going to play ever again. <laughs> yeah. So he was smart. He was a businessman, and it was this negotiation tactic on his part. But literally, mm-hmm. I thought, like, that's it for me. He's, you know, I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking he sabotaged me, so yeah. I had to go to SC. But he taught me, you know, he taught me a lot of valuable life lessons, but he taught me how to negotiate. He taught me about, you know, the power that you have. And, you know, you only have that power a couple of times in your life, and you have to utilize it. So, um, but it was a learning lesson, man. I was scared to death. I thought I was never going to play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, what was that burning moment? that said, you know what, I want to make my decision signing uh, to the Giants, you said? Yeah. yeah. Instead yeah. of going to college? Um, so there was, a, there was these, these uh, man, these guys, Hall of Fame superstars, Daryl Strawberry, Eric Davis, Chris Brown, a uh, bunch of dudes from the neighborhood would go to this park called Harbor Park, and it was a deal where they come out, all these guys were in the big leagues, and they work out and they call it the program. Mm-hmm. So one of my homeboys told me, like, man, they be down here at Harvard Park. You need to go down there and see what's up. Yeah. So I went out there, and they were hitting, so I would just pick the balls up, throw them back. Mm-hmm. Pick the balls up, throw them back. So I went out there for, like, two days straight. Finally, Eric Davis comes up. He goes, hey, kid, you grab a bat. So I'm like, oh, wow. yeah. So I had my little aluminum. He, not, he goes, no, nah, I hit with this. And I look at it, and it's Eric Davis bat, C-271. I'm like, damn. That's, is that wood? Yeah. yeah. So he gave me one of his bats. So he threw to me. It was kind of getting dark, and I started hitting. He was like, man, you got something. He's like, keep coming out here every day, and, you know, we're going to let you work out with us. So I was going out there from 17, 16 years old, and they started calling me the kid. And another legendary shortstop named Barry Larkin, he came out one off season, and – I was taking ground balls with Barry. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, I get to see how I can react with this dude. He's in the big league. So I was going all out. It's all dirt infield. So I was doing my thing. He's looking at me like, damn, dude, you can play. Mm-hmm. So I started telling him about, you know, I might have a chance to get drafted. And I know he went to Michigan. And I said, um, you know, what, what helped you make that decision, you know, to go to Michigan instead of signing? He goes, uh, you know, I just knew I wasn't ready as far as off the field. So he's like, I think you're ready. He told me. He said, I think you're ready. Mm-hmm. So that gave me all the confidence in the world because, you know, I grew up in a different situation, a little bit more exposure through the city growing up in L.A. and having this experience of being around them um, from 16 years old. And uh, he told me himself he thought I was ready, so that gave me the confidence. Wow. That's that's good. Awesome. I, like growing up, I did judo, and my dad always made me go with, like, the Olympic team himself, and I was like maybe 10, 11 years old. So just having those influences of people above you does give you that confidence. And like when you're going against them, you're like, damn, like I can compete. And like, so I think that's really crucial for a lot of people is just to build that confidence, especially at such a young age. And that's what they did to you. So rest yeah, you got to keep pushing it. Yeah, it's intimidating at first, you know that. Mm-hmm. But you just have to keep pushing it, and you know, you never know. Exactly. All right, Royce, we got to keep this going. It's yeah. time to go to you and burn. Mm-hmm. Unfortunate. Were there any unfortunate burn moments that happened that got you to where you're at today? Like myself, whenever I got burned in the science experiment, who knows if I would even have this podcast? Right, right. Yeah. Um, man, I was blessed like with my health and a lot of all those things. Um, 
I just always, outside of that, um, I just try to change anything that I felt was unfortunate into a positive situation. You know, we all have struggles, and it's not always, not always going to be easy, but as long as you keep going, you know, you got a chance. So um, I guess the first thing was um, it wasn't unfortunate. It was just, you know, going out there and, and being in real-life situations and not having that security because it was always in my head. Like, dang, man, if I mess this up, I'm not going to have nothing. Cause my dad was like, education, education. So that unfortunate expectation, that unfortunate kind of outlook kind of got me to saying, you know, I can educate myself. So I just started reading books that I wanted to read, whether it be finance, whether it be, you know, African-American culture, things that can just help my confidence. I just started reading like crazy, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> I'm not much of a book reader. <laughs> <laughs> I started reading like crazy because I didn't want to have that feeling of being stupid or not being educated. And the first thing, one of the books, the books attract you, you know, sometimes those books find you, you don't find the books. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> I remember reading a book and it was just talking about education, what it is. And the principle of knowledge is, uh, knowledge of self is the most powerful knowledge you can have on this planet. Knowing who you are, nobody can manipulate or control you. So I really started digging into that <clears throat> and um, and found my confidence in the fact that you know, I may be wrong for whatever you think is wrong, but I just feel in my gut. I know what's up. You know, I'm going to trust whatever I know that's good for me. Just like if you eat some food, you may be allergic to something, mm -hmm. right? And I may eat it and it's going to be good for me. Yeah. So why is everything that we talk about knowledge is going to be good for you is good for me? It's not the case. Yeah, Everybody's a different individual. You have to find out what's right for you. So it's not like you said, having a physical ailment or being burned or anything mm -hmm. like that, but it kind of forced me into an awakening of myself um, to just having that over my head, this constant thing about the fear of, of not making it and all these stories you hear about being broke and not having education. And it, it it truly gave me an opportunity to understand what education is. Mm -hmm. And I, I kinda try to push that on my kids today, but you know, they're on their own they're on their own path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um I just don't believe in institutionalized education. Yeah. Yeah. I think education is obviously very important to have, but I feel like everyone's path is different too. And like for me, I'm I'm staying at home and I'm taking like online classes and stuff, but I'm learning more from being around my dad and like business stuff than following like the education system. So I, yeah, like you said, everyone's different and everyone has their own path. And obviously you took your own path and yeah. you capitalized on it. So that's yeah. awesome. That's important. Everybody's different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, it's your path's going to be different from your brother's. His is going to be different. But unfortunately, they try to put everybody in a box. Mm -hmm. And it's easy once you put everybody in a box because you control the box. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you control the box and you control everybody. Yeah, yeah. So you understand that. And like I said, it was tough for me because my kids are now going through the process of choosing schools and, mm -hmm. and you know, going through the educational, you know, indoctrination system. But I just said, choose what you want. Like I was telling you guys earlier, my oldest, like, he's a surfer. He plays baseball. He's good, but he chose Hawaii because he likes to surf. And I was like, "Well, that's a good reason to choose that school." Yeah, because mm -hmm. why go somewhere else? You're not going to get the same stuff that they're teaching you over here. It's the same thing. Yeah. So he choose. He he made a decision that was based on passion, something that he likes to do and is right for his spirit. And for me, I was like, "Well, that's the right decision for you. You can't go wrong." Yeah. Um, schools are so tough trying to choose to like what colleges you want to go to and stuff, but do you hope your sons follow your path you chose of trying to make it to the MLB? Man, <laughs> there's sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. What's funny, because my youngest, Elijah, I have two girls uh, and a boy that are triplets, <clears throat> and they're 16. Elijah's one of the top players in the country. Yeah, he just won, like, player of the year, shortstop, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah congrats yeah. to him on that. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Congrats. And he won it as a sophomore. I didn't get it until wow. I was a senior. So he, <laughs> like, yeah, he won up to you. <laughs> he's bragging so, towards so you. So he's, like, you know, he's getting offers from everywhere. And SC, mm -hmm. he, was, he was like, man, I don't want to go to SC. Uh, I said, well, just go take the trip. Yeah. So I made him do it like my dad. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think he's, you know, he's going to make his decision. But I just go, go check it out. Just mm -hmm. be informed. 
He went to Cal. He was kind of sticking his nose up about Cal Berkeley. Mm. So he's got some, you know, decisions to make, but it's going to be his. But, mm -hmm. you know, behind the scenes, you know, my brother, me and my brother talked to him. And, you know, his mom's, like, getting on him a little bit. Like, man, you need to listen to your dad and your brother and, his, <laughs> and your uncle. Yeah. He's like, I do, but I just don't say nothing to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Trying to keep secrets. Right, so. right, yeah. right. So he tries to make it seem like, oh, I ain't listening to you. Who yeah. cares? But, you know, it's going to be his decision. Um, if it was his decision, to be honest with you, he's like, Dad, I just want to go play. And I understand that, you know. So I did set the same bar to say, okay, if you go in the first round, then you can go play. <laughs> go play <now. laughs> yeah. Right. So I set the standard. I said, you know, but – if it doesn't, at least you have that, you know. At least you can go, you know, go to that path to continue to play and, uh, you know, go to school and do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it's just good that he does have those options. Mm -hmm. Is Cal a really good baseball team for college? It's Yeah, they're, they're getting better. They're getting a lot better. The SEC and ACC seem to have, like, these powerhouse teams. Ole Miss won it last year. Yeah. But it's different. I said, man, you ain't never been to Mississippi. You grew up here in L.A. Yeah. Imagine a kid yeah. from Mississippi coming out here. So it's the same type of deal. So there's adjustments that you'd have to make. But uh, to be honest with you, as far as, like, choosing a college, I, I'd hope that um, he choose somewhere in California. Yeah. yeah. Be close by you guys. Well, just, you know, those are good <laughs> options to have. Like, yeah. My oldest, like I said, I was trying to get him to, to somehow look at you know, Cal State Fullerton, a couple yeah. of schools nearby. But I just knew when he was talking about Hawaii, I was like, well, I've lost that battle. He was like, yeah, he was like, I'm he's gone. He packed his surfboard <laughs> up, a couple bags, and he was good. He didn't yeah. even pack up nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he's happy. He's doing well. Mm -hmm. That's good. So do you surf then too? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I got him into surfing. Yeah? Yeah, all the, all the kids. The girls, the girls body surf. They just like little That's mermaids. Nice. Yeah. But the boys, we always, you know, it's something that we do. We ski together, so. All the stuff I could do uh, after I retired, I started doing it with them. So it's been it's been fun. Yeah, I went through my little surfing phase. Yeah, I, he, I surfed he was awful. <laughs> he was awful. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I was not the greatest, but uh, I started getting it. My problem is I had or my friend gave me a board. It was a torque board, and it was like yeah. I want to say it was like five eleven. It was short, yeah. so it was tough. It would always like slide right under me and. All kind of stuff. But I got the hang of it, so don't hate on me too much. But and you never know, fun. you get back at it. Yeah, watch. I'll go pro and then I'll shove it in the face. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Be like, yeah. what? But no, surfing's fun and it's good to like clear your mind and just be out there. Absolutely. It's such such a vibe. Yeah. For sure. The water yeah. just scares me. <laughs> yeah, I just saw a shark attack. I think a shark attack out here in, in San Del Mar, Diego. yeah. yeah. It was down in Del Mar. I hate that. Everybody shoots okay. me information about it. I was like, why y'all messing with me about, oh, I saw this shark? Yeah. Like, but people like to mess with people that they know get in the water a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, you can feel it. Sometimes you can feel the energy. It's like, man, I know there's yeah. something under here. Yeah. <laughs> but you just kind of got to clear out your mind. Mm -hmm. But you can't really let something like that kind of get, get in the way of your passion and joy. So. Exactly. Yeah. You can't constantly live in fear. No. You got to go out there and do it, man. This portion of the Burn Factory podcast is sponsored by Phoenix Salon Suites. Please visit Phoenix Salon Suites at P-H-E-N-I-X Salons, S-A-L-O-N, Suites, S-U-I-T-E-S dot -E com to find one near you. Yeah, that's very unfortunate. Like just that pressure that you, you kind of built on yourself, so to say. But let's move into R. R stands for ridiculous. So you play 17 years in the league. Like there's tons of traveling, staying in hotels. Like was there a ridiculous burn moment that you had? Like a ridiculous fan asked you something, or was there just something kind of like funny and ridiculous? Um, most ridiculous thing is I had a crazy stalker. Ah. Uh. Yeah, and you know it was just like it was a tension to the team because. Well, it first started, I noticed somebody was kind of like at my apartment complex, and you could just feel somebody kind of looking. I was like, well, okay, somebody's in that car. And I had, you know, garage, so I parked my car, go out, and I felt that. And I looked at the car, I just like could see somebody in there. So next road trip, I come back home, and it was real late this time, and I see the same car. So I could tell it was a female, so I just go knock on the window. And... She was petrified, like, sitting there, like, you could tell she was scared. And I was just like, roll down the window. And I was like, um, I know you're here, you know, you've been here. Yeah. 
And could you please stop, you know, following me? This is not cool. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry, whatever. So I was smart enough to write down license plate number. And uh, the, the, at the time, there were no cameras and all that stuff. But at, this, at the ballpark, they knew this vehicle was kept coming to the player's gate. Oh. She parked by the player's gate. After you already told her? This was before, yeah. Oh, before, before, before you went up, up to her. They, okay, they, okay. You know, they identify suspicious activity. Yeah. So, you know, it's just an eye-opening experience to really always be aware of your, of your surroundings. But I did catch on to that, you know, because who's going to be sitting in the car, you know, at 2, 3, 2 30 and 3 o'clock in the morning? So, you know, it's just kind of... Give you a, gives you a real real type of energy about being in the spotlight, being in that situation. And it could have been dangerous. But, but yeah, you just, you know, it comes part and parcel with it. I was going to say, did that happen during the regular season? Yeah, yeah. Did that ever affect the way you play, just knowing that, like, someone's just stalking you? No, I, I just <laughs> left it at that, to be honest with you. Okay. You know, security's real good. They took record of it. You know, of course, she didn't do nothing. But at the same time, you just don't want some something to escalate into something crazy, you know. Um, you know, you don't know what the people have the potential to do, but they still shouldn't be sitting outside where you live mm -hmm. at two thirty in, in the morning, sitting in their car, yeah. you know. So um, they just know, wanted to make note of the activity. Said, pay attention if you go to a restaurant, wherever you're at, make sure that the car's not there. If you do hit us up, but you know, they did notice that she was continuing to park there. So they were marking down vehicles, and they knew that vehicle was around the player's gate very frequently. So, so after you went up to her, did did she did you ever see her again? No. Mm -mm. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I'm mean, least. I mean, so I'm sure she can go to any game she wants to probably sign an autograph for. Her, probably have in the past. I just didn't notice. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's just that at Not your at, that, your, at like, your place where you stay. Yeah, gosh, that's scary, especially nowadays with social media. I mean. Well, this is back scary. in the day before that. No, I know. <laughs> I know, but yeah. But I'm saying now it's, yeah, it's a lot it's, worse. You hear so many stories about it, and it's just like, man, always yeah. got to keep your head on a swivel. And yeah. they got, you know, they could Google map your place. They know where you live. So it's so easy to pick up stuff with technology today. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I was trying to figure out, like, dang, how does she even know where I live? Yeah. She probably been following me. Wow. Yeah. Did you ever, like, post anything, like, where you lived or like, <laughs> it's easy to have it say, yeah. no such thing as post. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy guy thing, is it? Yeah. It's all good, I but forgot, yeah. I forgot. Yeah. I That's forgot. when the <laughs> internet was being born, though. I was yeah. out there. It was in San Francisco. Yeah. Well, I mean, all that was happening. Nowadays, you go on like Safari and it's like a hunt series protected, like 117 trackers from tracking you. It's just like, geez, like, yeah. who's trying to track me? And like, what's there to track about? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, that was just an unfortunate, weird moment because. Like I said, she didn't do anything illegal. It just felt felt uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely eerie. But all right, let's move on to the last letter. N N is actually two parts. So first one is now. So is there any burn moments going on like now in your life that you see happening? Um, it's always evolving. You know, just just focus on the kids and whatever they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, coaching is awesome. You know, it's always something in your mind that you're concerned about with trying to help these young young men pursue their their futures and um you know it's a teaching thing for me i learn a lot in, in in return but it's it's also an opportunity to pass on the knowledge i have about the game that i love but also teaching these young guys about life you know and baseball gives me that opportunity to do that not just and like i said to coach my own boys, it was great. They want to, you know, see I have championship together. Yeah, I saw that. Congrats. Yeah, it was, that was good yeah, before Royce congrats. graduated. Um, but I also, in the anticipation of, you know, being a father, it was just like, man, I, I want to have teaching moments with my with my kids. But at, at the house, it's never like that right moment, mm -hmm. kind of. It's like, oh, pull aside and let me tell you this. Yeah. No, but on the baseball field, they listen to me differently. It's like, coach, you know, everybody's yeah. looking at me, so they're looking at me. So I, you know, teach them, teach certain things about life, how baseball, being a, a good, a good teammate, uh, willing to sacrifice, you know, having the right type of work ethic and all these things that applies to their lives. So um, it really gives me the opportunity to be, you know, dad and coach. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, they call me coach on, at, at the field. They don't never <laughs> call, call, call me dad. Yeah, <laughs> call dad. But, uh, yeah, I love all the guys, man. Everybody that's ever played for me. It's uh, eight years now. Wow. And guys always come back, yeah. you know, and they talk about the program. They talk to the guys that are there, talk about their experience. So it's just a ever-evolving thing and, you know, good impact as far as the program. And uh, just thankful I'm able to coach and do the things I'm doing. What what was that like that burning moment saying, you know what I sh- I should coach a high school baseball team? Yeah, uh, a buddy of mine was like, <clears throat> you know, because the kids were getting a little older, and I knew Oaks was a great school, be good for their education, athletics, and uh, a buddy of mine was like, hey man, Oaks Christian coach just left. Would you consider coaching? I'm like, my kids are fifth grade, sixth grade. He's like, man, you could just stay until they're ready. Yeah, <laughs> you exactly. know, coach now. Yeah. And I thought about it, and I was like, man, I'd, I'd like to see how it is. And, you know, considering the, uh, the opportunity as far as uh, see how it is to coach high school level baseball, see how these young, young men are thinking, and instead of just complaining about how, man, the game's changed and they don't know this, they don't know that will impact it positively at the high school level. Yeah. So by the time they get to the college level, to the pro level, they'll have the skill sets that we appreciate as ex-players. Yeah. So um, when I started doing that, I got the opportunity to, to uh, be the head coach at Oaks. I bought in guys like Jeff Weaver, who was a former major league pitcher. I bought in Demetri Young, who uh, played, played a 13-year, 14-year career. Uh, bought in Joe Borchard, who played for a while. So I just thought I'd bring in guys in the, in the area that would have that experience to help me coach these guys in all different aspects of the game. So, And then, you know, it just kind of fulfilled. Dimitri got a head job at Camarillo. Mm-hmm. So that whole nucleus of trying to help these young guys, not just at Oaks but at other schools, to give them the right type of baseball acronym has spread. So mm-hmm. I think that um, – and what me being involved helped open that open that situation up a bit, and uh, like I said, I just think that the way the game needs to evolve, we can have an impact to help you know get back to guys that can really play the game. Yeah, is it is it difficult to like coach your sons? Like, is it like what is that balance of being like a dad but being a balance of like being a coach on the field? I'm pretty laid back, so uh-huh. it's not like, you know, I don't get on about making mistakes, none of that. None of the guys. Yeah. Um, Royce, I didn't say he wasn't part, you know, but he, he just went about his business. He just goes hard. Elijah's very passionate. Like, he, he'll he get, he like, runs. last yeah. year, I remember a game, he made a couple mistakes, and he was hanging his head, mm. like, in the middle of the game. And I was like, yo, what are you doing? So afterwards, that's that's the only time after the game, pull them aside. Like, man, don't ever hang your head. Yeah. Don't ever let anybody know that you're down. Don't ever let yourself get down because this game will beat you up. <laughs> and, um, you know, just that, that type of moment is, yeah, it's a father moment, but as a coach, if any of my guys did that, I'd pull them aside, say don't ever let, you know, get your head down like that. So um, the separation is easy. Because I'm just coaching. Yeah. And they go out there. Uh, fortunately, they were good players. That, just <laughs> <laughs> that went out and worked hard. Didn't yeah. have to get on them about not, yeah. you know, slacking. But, man, to be honest with you, most of the guys that come through the program, they just go hard, man. Because mm-hmm. they already know the expectation. Because I don't have a problem. You can make a mistake. That's cool. Yeah. Just go hard. Just just give it what you got. And they, they pass on that information because we – you know, I want them to be leaders. So, like, the older guys would teach teaching the younger guys. Mm-hmm. And that's what I always said. That's your responsibility. I teach you something. You teach somebody else. So the program's become that. So I'm just kind of standing back now as a coach. Yeah. And, like, man, look at these dudes do their thing. Yeah. Right? But them dudes, them young dudes can't wait to be like, yeah, I'm going to be a leader too. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a good way um, to coach. But I think most coaches – Coaches out there, quit quit trying to hold on, man. Just let the kid, just let them do their thing. Yeah. They, too many coaches I coach against try to control too much. It's like they control every aspect of the game, and, and it's almost like they're playing. Yeah, it's like let them play. Trust that you've given them the information to go out there and do what they need to do. Yeah, 
And so I just chill, man. I don't do nothing, no, yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah, it seems like you've established a great culture. And that's what, I mean, you need to have a successful team. So that's definitely really cool to see. Yeah, it's been fun. Last year was real fun, you know, because I didn't realize how, you know, I, I was what, playing the CIF championship twice, never won one. And I didn't realize going into it, I was like, tell the kids, hey, one day we're going to hang a banner. We're going to win the CIF championship. I knew that culturally we do the right things in order to do that. It wasn't like <clears throat> talent. I understood talent. But you have to have some of that. Mm -hmm. But if we go about the right way, then we're already winners. And that will be a byproduct of it. That's the, that's the way I, th I thought. So when we did it, and we're, I'm coaching against guys that coached for 30 years and never won one, I was like, dang, this is going to be hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, to do it after, what, eight seasons, it was, it was a, a great moment. The guys deserved it. The program deserved it. And it wasn't just the guys that played on the field on that year. It was the guys that preceded them. And that's what I told the dudes that came back to watch those games. I said, you guys are responsible for this. Yeah. Because without you, you guys set the tone. And that's how the program got to where, where it is now with these dudes that go out there and play unselfishly and know how to go about it. Was it ever hard to, like, coach high schoolers? Man, heck yeah. <laughs> Parents are a trip. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Parents, Parents are, are the worst. They, uh, thank you. I didn't yeah. have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I just know. <laughs> they be tripping, bro. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the hardest thing to manage is the parents. Mm -hmm. Dudes on the field, I got that. But the parents, yeah, I just try to keep them at bay and understand. I said, I can't do it without you. So we all got to pull in the, in the same direction. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, a lot of coaches, great coaches that I know, just quit coaching because of the parents because it's just too much. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, man. I was like thinking to myself, my dad never talked to my coaches ever. My mom, I was like, where do y'all come from? Yeah. <laughs> and, and they just, they set a pressure like on the kid. It affects right. the kid because at home they're like, oh man, like you need to play better like this, this, and this. And then uh -huh. now the kid's going into the game affected by his parent. And then now the parents getting involved with you. So yeah. it's kind of an issue, but. No, it's tough. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but we've done, you know, we've done a, better job at managing it. But it, initially, it was the toughest thing about being a coach. Yeah. The toughest thing, dealing with parents, emails, having these conversations. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was really difficult. All right, well, so part two is next. So this upcoming season, is there any burn moments that you're going to see, like a tough team that is on your schedule? Like, is there any burn moments that you foresee happening? I think our league is always going to be competitive, you know, although – you know, we won the CIF championship. We have a lot of guys coming back. I just know our league is always going to be very competitive, even before the playoffs. So that's good because, you know, we battle, we, we're battle tested going into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. um, interesting enough, I was like, man, I don't know how it's going to be coming in to off of a championship season. The toughest thing to do is repeat because, yeah. you know, guys get complacent. Um, a lot of different things change, but. Uh, we got we had a lot of good young players come in as freshmen, and they're pushing hard. They want to be part of that championship dynamic, and our older players have stepped up. So I'm very happy with how you know everybody came came to conditioning this this fall, uh, how this fall is going. Uh, all the things I was kind of apprehensive about, kind of, I'm still aware of it. You know. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's better than what I thought, you know, as far as guys' attitudes, um, guys' expectations. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think the burn moment is going to be, you know, having that target on our back as champions and trying to repeat. It's tough. I mean, you see it with football teams after they win the – Super Bowl, they just not that good the next <laughs> season. Super Bowl <laughs> hangover. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's every sport because like yeah. you say, you do you get complacent and you kind of get lazy. Like, oh yeah, we can like we already did it, whatever. But yeah. then you got to lean on your leadership of your team to be like, no, like we got to stay hungry and stuff. So. What what yeah. division are you guys? Uh, we'll be division two. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I think, um, you know, the guys that were juniors, we have a real core of uh, of junior p players that have been, you know on varsity since probably their sophomore years. And um, I think they don't want to go out like a mediocre note. So yeah. that's the good part because 
you know, when you're a senior, and I always tell them, I said, man, this is the last time you'll be laced them up. Some of these dudes will never lace them up again. And so, you know, there's always that push for that senior class to, you know, try to help them go out on top. And, you know, that's some of the messaging we used last year because we only had, like, five seniors. Yeah. But this year we got, like, seven in their main core guys. So um, I like to see them go out on top, yeah. and I'm sure they'd like to see it, see it happen too. So you have the core of your team still left, though, for yeah. the season? Okay. Yeah. That's good. That's yeah. Good. All right, Royce. Yeah. Well, you just felt burning your life. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you so much for being on. So tell our audience where you can find you, uh, Instagram, um, whatever. Man, I don't – what is it? I think it's – oh, Royce Clayton, C-L-A-Y, in the number 10. So, yeah, that's all I got, man. I don't really <laughs> mess around with that stuff. Yeah. I do have Instagram. I had to get that. Yeah. Um, that's – yeah, just check us out. Um, support Oaks Christian. We got uh, – I don't even know if we got a thing. We've been going back and forth with who controls our Instagram uh, at the school. yeah. I'm like, man, this social media stuff is it's crazy. It's way too much. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just Royce Clay 10, C L A Y, and number 10. You heard the man, go follow him. <laughs> <laughs> give him some love, yeah. give him some love. Yeah. Especially Oaks Christian. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. But, all right, well, this is cool. I hope you've been taking some golf lessons because we're about to go play some golf. Let's do it. That's what that's my hey, I'm excited about the, getting my belt. I'm about to take oh, my belt. Right, right, right. You might have to be careful about that. Okay, we're gonna see. I'm that taking that stay. belt. But, well, lucky for you, I've been warming up since eight o'clock this morning. So. Oh, okay. No, I got an excuse. I ain't hit any balls, but we'll see. But, all right. Thank you, Royce, for yeah, being on. It was a pleasure. On. No, thank you guys. Appreciate it. It's awesome.